Thanks. Okay, so welcome to this presentation that we have entitled Creative Ways for Multi-Stakeholder Engagement. So the contents of this presentation will be, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce you to the Science for Change methodology in citizen science projects. And then I would like uh, to present you our methodology applied to the Dinosis project. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, uh, is one of our uh, pioneer projects and tackles uh, other pollution that I am not sure that you have heard about. I hope not, because it's not really uh, pleasant to, to be affected by, by, by other pollution, but it's uh, one of the uh, second cause uh, of environmental um, annoyments after noise. So, so it's quite important. And I will present you two of the pilots of this project. So uh, the one that we have conducted in Barcelona and then another um, in Uganda, in Kampala. So what do we do? Uh, we use a highly inclusive and highly replicable methodology based on community engagement, uh, co-creation and citizen science. And what we want to do is to generate uh, together with citizens and other stakeholders new sets of data to allow social innovations uh, to tackle social environmental challenges that are affecting communities. So uh, we try to involve communities in a very inclusive way. Um, we hope to democratize uh, social environmental issues in the sense that uh, they can affect everyone. So um, we try to involve uh, people affected by, for example, other pollution, regardless it's social realities, uh, gender, literacy levels, cultural or religious affiliations, socioeconomic status, age, disabilities, etc. So we we need to adapt methods and tools to meet inclusiveness. This, this sounds like uh, really nice in paper, um, but it is uh, really, really challenging in the real life. So I hope to, to give you some hints about this in my presentation. So we involve citizens in science to improve society. We use citizen science, uh, we engage communities, uh, we try to involve communities in co-creation, and uh, we do user-centered uh, and bottom-up approaches. So we hope to start uh, projects that are interesting for the communities that we want to involve in. Uh, we want to be highly inclusive. Um, we want to be highly adaptable and full, uh, following the sustainable uh, development goals, also contributing to them. And we also follow the dimensions of, the dimensions of responsible research and innovation. I don't know if you have heard about this, but um, these are the ones. So it's public engagement, um, comply with gender equality, science education. Uh, I will give you some examples about this later. Open access, ethics, uh, and governance. And as I said, to produce new sets of data uh, for social innovations to tackle social environmental challenges. And uh, last but not least, um, one of the things that I will not go deep in my presentation, but uh, for us it's very, very important that citizen science projects also inform policies and uh, are able to improve policies um, to improve social environmental challenges. So one of the things that are very important for us um, in our projects is to involve uh, the quadruple helix. So um, we think that, for example, in the case of auto pollution, if we don't involve industries and if we don't involve the local governments, it's very difficult that we can um, reach changes in, in some of the, of the problems that are affecting communities. So obviously um, the power of citizens are, is super important, but we also need um, the other actors so how can we do this? How can we involve all these actors in co-creation strategies to, to improve a problem? I don't know if you've heard uh, about this in previous presentations in your course. I won't go deep into it, but um, we follow uh, the extreme citizen science approach. So as you see in, in here in, in this graphic, the classic citizen science uh, is mainly um, for participants with uh, high literacy levels, so people with PhDs, postgraduates, university, that start 
uh, participating in the project from the data collection. So the main um, things uh, that they contribute is data collection, then maybe a little bit less in classification and analysis, and maybe less, less, less in visualization and, and basic analysis. So what we want to do in our projects is uh, to involve citizens from the beginning. So from problem definition, because uh, if the definition of the problem does not make sense for them, it's very difficult that they will participate or it's very difficult that it, it will make sense for, for them to be involved, right? <coughs> so, um, as I said, we want to involve any academic level, any gender, any sociocultural and socioeconomic realities, uh, mainly adapting the tools that we use for engagement. So, we can say level four is a deeper form of citizen participation in science. This is our team. Um, in order to do this, uh, we, I, I don't, I will not go in deep in, in each of, of us, but um, we need a, a, a transdisciplinary team. So the message is we need a transdisciplinary team to tackle all this um, because uh, we have chemical engineers, we have people in communication, I'm a social scientist. So it's, it's uh, very relevant to, to have all this expertise in order to tackle all this. Um, so if you don't have, uh, I don't know, if you want to interrupt me or, or anything, as we are not a lot of, of participants, uh, I don't mind, so you can, you can do so. Otherwise, I will continue and uh, I will explain you how um, we have adapted this methodology applied to the Dinosis project. So is there any question so far? Okay. I think. I'm not seeing you because I have my mm -hmm. my full screen. So yeah, just just you can just yeah. speak on the mic. But just you just uh, unmute yourself and you can ask the question. That's the invitation of Nora. Thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we can do it at the end. So the Dinosis project um, is a three-year project. Actually, uh, it was meant to finish this month. But um, as COVID came, and you can imagine that um, we had uh, many challenges to overcome in this past year. Um, so we have an extension and now it will finish in September this year. So this is a project that tackles uh, other pollution. Uh, so other problems um, from environmental odors. Uh, we are working in 10 different uh, sites that uh, I will present and our um, methodology um, aims to, uh, so the project aims to raise awareness in other pollution at a global level, but uh, working first at the local level, then at the national level, and then going to the global level. So we are a transdisciplinary team uh, of 14 partners uh, with other experts, citizen science experts. We have also city councils and industrial associations. As I said, for us, it's very important uh, to involve the quadruple helix to be successful in the different pilots. So these are our tools. So we have created another observatory because uh, we want to comply with principle 10. So we would like um, to inform policy making and inform uh, other stakeholders uh, as uh, the quadruple helix citizens etc um, about other pollution because it's not a well-known topic and as there is no legislation about it in general there's some legislations in, in in the world but not many uh, as it's very difficult to measure as I, I won't go deep into this because i prefer to speak about um how we we implemented citizen science initiatives in here, but uh, we have uh, developed an app, which is this one that is called Other Collect. And with this app, uh, we are able to map other observations and co-create with citizens uh, maps uh, where we can understand uh, how uh, the other issue is affecting communities. So we create these maps uh, with other observations that can inform us um, about how the people is affected by the problem. And this is the first time that it's being done as traditional um, 
techniques uh, to measure odors usually have been uh, applied uh, in the industries or by the local authorities, but never involving the people who was affected. So this kind of data uh, is only possible using citizen science. That's the message. So these are our pilots. I will present two of them. So Barcelona and Kampala in Uganda. So um, this is uh, the Forum area of Barcelona. This is an area um, that has many um, historical other issues um, since a long time. Um, in the area, there's a variety of emitting activities, so waste and wastewater treatment plants, amongst other. And uh, another important characteristic is that um, there's different social realities inhabiting here affected by the problem. So as you can see, um, there has been, I won't go in deep in the historics, but um, this area was a very deprived area and still it is, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, with these uh, social buildings. And um, there has been like a refurbishing lately in the last years. And now you can see <clears throat> that this is uh, very contrasting, <clears throat> sorry, with <clears throat> the other, um, the other pictures, there's a port here with some boats. Blah, blah. So our challenge here, uh, obviously, as I said before, was to engage um, very different uh, social realities, very different communities that were affected the same by the problem. So I think this will be um, very similar to which uh, Mariana was proposing in terms of the phases um, to conduct your citizen science uh, projects or initiatives. That's a little bit um, the steps that we, that we were um, working by in, in our project. So first of all, we um, wanted to identify the issues. So we did uh, ethnographic research and uh, we conducted also technical research on the other studies that um, were um, available. Uh, actually, they were not available. We had to uh, go to the environmental authorities and present the project and convince them that uh, this was a good project for them. Um, to participate in. This was a long time, actually, we don't have a lot of time now to, to go into details, but this has last, lasted for three years. So it's been a long way. Um, so we started uh, identifying those issues in terms of other and in terms of social uh, characteristics of, of the area to do the engagement. Then we uh, went into the second phase. Uh, so we did stakeholder mapping. Uh, first of all, we did a theoretical exercise identifying the other emitting activities, uh, communities, CSOs, NGOs, public sector research. And uh, we did uh, also an exercise uh, with the knowledge that we had at that moment um, to map potential motivations, barriers for uh, these stakeholders' participation and appoint some mitigation strategies. This was done at the theoretical level, but this had, has helped a lot uh, when, when going to the real world and starting engaging people. So I really recommend to do this exercise. So some of the questions that uh, could be co-defined, um, and this uh, maybe could give you some insights about it. So um, at this point, who are the key stakeholders to be engaged? Uh, of course, the list can increase together uh, with the project. So do we need to engage stakeholders from the quadruple helix? Do we really need uh, these four types of stakeholders in our specific project? Um, what is the best engagement strategy for each stakeholder group? How do we start speaking with each one? Um, is it better to organize a meeting with a public authority? Is it better to go to an association and speak with the citizens, um, participate in community events? Um, what, what it is better for your, for your specific project. So what is the level of participation of each stakeholder group? So will they participate just in data collection? Do we want to involve them from the beginning of the project and try to co-design the research question? 
at which step of the project do we want to involve the citizens? Do we want to involve the citizens at the beginning? Um, do we need the citizens at all? If we do citizen science, obviously is, is crucial. Um, are we using a classic citizen science approach or maybe a more extreme approach, um, trying to be inclusive, trying to involve the people from the, from the beginning uh, of our phases? Shall we revisit co-design our research question together with the stakeholders or as, as researchers, we have our research question and we do not care about other stakeholders? What is the best strategy to collect data? Do we need to co-design a tool for data collection? Uh, I was, um, I think Mariana mentioned before um, um, something about an app. Um, I do not recommend. I do not recommend to <laughs> to create an app. It's, it's a very tough. Uh, it's it's not that I don't recommend it, but for us it's been very very a very tough um, process because it's not easy. But anyway, it's another story. And can we ensure inclusiveness? So then we went after stakeholder mapping onto the second phase, uh, which was frame the problem. And we started meetings with the regional authorities, meetings with the CSOs, visits to the meeting industries to better understand the problem. We did lots of visits uh, with communities uh, to CSOs, um, to historical archives, um, to some shops, and we were asking um, how was the problem lived by the people, if they would like to participate in this program, etc. We did lots, 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 lots of actions. So we were nearly living there for a while. Uh, we participated in the local radio. We were doing sensory walks with citizens to understand uh, how the other problem was perceived uh, with the industries. We did workshops with kids in the weekends. We mapped the places that we thought uh, they were relevant uh, to meet people. Uh, we were going to swimming pools. We were going to parties. Obviously, this was not at COVID times, as you can see. Um, we were doing some uh, community events, uh, other trainings. We did a lot of things and we had a lot of fun, by the way. Then we started to organize other trainings um, to understand, on the one hand, um, the others present in the area. We were training people to use the app and we were discussing uh, how was the problem affecting the citizens. And we were doing also sensory works to gather data together with the citizens. We gathered more than 560 other observations uh, during 12 months. And actually the frequency of the other observations varied depending on the engagement actions that we were doing with communities. So when we were doing uh, this training, so when we were doing this uh, community engagement actions, or we were participating in local events, we had lots of observations. So it's quite important to, to keep on with, with engagement from our experience. So here's some more questions uh, that can make you reflect a bit. So how can we maintain the engagement during data collection? Because at the beginning it's really nice. Like, yeah, you know, I'm affected by others. Let's participate, blah, blah, blah. But then when you have to put observations every day, it's like, mm, it's not that fun. So do we need community champions? Actually we did, we use um, this um, approach. And we had uh, some people that were helping us to involve other people in the community. And those were our community champions. So then we need to ask us questions as how we validate our data, how we interpret our data. Um, do we provide feedback to the citizens? Um, are the citizens participated in, participating in data analysis? Um, do we have the potential to inform policies? How are we connecting with policymakers? How are we communicating about our project, et cetera? Um, so we analyzed this data and now um, this data has been visualized and shared with communities. Actually, a, pre a preliminary report has been uh, already sent. Uh, we are trying to correlate other observations uh, with industrial operations, because actually this is the aim of, one of the aims of having uh, all these uh, other maps. So uh, the aim is to correlate the other observations that we gather with industrial operations and look for improvements. Sometimes 
is as easy as not always, but sometimes it's as easy as, as uh, opening a door uh, with a track at a time when citizens are sleeping and not at the time when citizens, for example, go um, to gather the kids um, from school. So sometimes uh, it's a matter of, of little things uh, that uh, could be improved. Now uh, we have gained the approval of the regional authority, but uh, we have struggled a lot because obviously um, this is a delicate um, topic. Um, we are creating a group now with the meeting activities in order to be able to correlate this data and all this will be reflected in a report for, for communities. So that's pretty much what we have done in Barcelona. I don't know uh, if, I don't know if it's late. Um, how much time do, we, do I have Andrea left? Let me see. Can I ask a question? Ah, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, sorry, you asked Andrea something. Yes, no, no, uh, go ahead, Luke. Uh, we we still have time, Nora. We have, uh, huh? we have, we can say ten minutes more. Okay. Um, so about the steps, you pointed out eight steps um, how you conducted the research. By the way, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now I can see you. Just to see your face. It's ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. So. My question is, you, you pointed out eight steps uh, from problem research, going all this, the steps. You came up, uh, yeah, all of them. Yeah, so you came up with those steps based on uh, citizen science. Is it an established approach, those steps, or is it your own approach you developed in the project? That's a very good question. So we came up with this approach. Um, doing uh, research and using different models. Uh, one of the models that we use, uh, it was the extreme citizen science approach that uh, has been created in London uh, by a research team uh, at University College London. And then uh, we kind of uh, did a model using also a model that is called the Bristol approach from another organization that is Ideas for Change. And then we kind of uh, use the expertise on other pollution and the expertise on applying the quadruple helix model. And we came out with this, with this model. So it's been like mm -hmm. a process uh, the, on the first year of the project. Quite complex, but very, very, what should I say? Correct. Very, very good approach. Very nice steps. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, obviously this is a three-year project. Uh, it's a European project, so we have had like the time and and the resources to to be able to to do it in in this way, right? I mean, actually, this project was uh, conceived like a long time ago. Um, because um, actually um, the CEOM founder of Science for Change, uh, we, who is Rosa Arias, um, has a long story uh, with other pollution. And she was very concerned about how um, the citizens were not included in all this. So this is uh, where all started, we can say, and this was a long time ago, but finally we got the funding so we could develop the project. Uh, and the odor pollution is mainly because of waste or industrial odor? It has a uh, lot of sources actually. So um, the pilots in our project uh, are uh, on different, so we have a pilot in Portugal that uh, the odors are coming from a rendering plant. In Barcelona, uh, it has been about uh, mainly waste and wastewater treatment plants. Um, it, it depends. But mainly in the project, we have focus on environmental others coming from Thank the place. Mm -hmm. mainly. Yeah, thanks so much for, for the questions. No, that we so have five minutes left. So, and then, then comes Claire, but then we can have some, some minutes after Claire's presentation to bring all together because it's related to your presentation as well. So five minutes would be great. Perfect. Yeah, uh, actually, um, I wanted to go deep on the Barcelona case, but just to just to show you that this methodology can be 
Okay, so really I'm just putting you here <laughs> to see my presentation. Um, so just to let you know that this methodology can be applied in other contexts, um, and we tried to to apply it to apply it uh, to the context of Uganda. Uh, we had partners working already in Uganda in air quality, and they discovered that other pollution uh, was an issue there. So the people uh, was complaining a lot. Local authorities were concerned. This was present in the mass media. So we said, yeah, why not? I mean, this was not uh, in the original proposal, but we said, yeah, why not? We can try. So um, the objectives are quite different, but we wanted to improve the monitoring of other pollution. Uh, using uh, this methodology, we um, thought that we could work with schools uh, because um, they were working with schools already and the city council uh, holds some of the schools. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to do some science education also. And then we wanted to work uh, in the markets with women. And um, we engaged uh, an NGO that is called Mapping for Communities there. And we started this pilot project. So I, I will just show you some photos. We started engaging um, people from the waste management sector and from the city council in order to, to understand a little bit more the other pollution problems there. Uh, we did some teacher training. Uh, we created a, a, a schools program together with the teachers and, and we started introducing other pollution in the schools. Actually, the teachers themselves uh, were introducing the schools. We just did the training, and then they were introducing the program in different schools. Then the kids were mapping others. Um, actually, in this uh, slide, you can see how we also adapt the methodology because it was uh, difficult for them to have phones with data and everything. And these are little kids, of course. So um, a lot of them, they didn't have phones. Um, so we were using a paper and pen to map other observations. And then this uh, has been digitized to analyze the data. So they were training um, other uh, classes also in, in terms of other pollution. Um, obviously, this was not in COVID times, as you can see. <laughs> this would, would be uh, totally impossible now. Um, then COVID came, so we had to adapt everything. So the material was adapted to children. Uh, the community engagement officer there were uh, reaching children in communities and they were doing some activities also um, to continue with the program and activities were distributed and we have been um, quite successful in this sense. And we have continued the project uh, as we could. So then uh, some interviews uh, were done with women in markets. And actually, um, this is my last slide. Uh, we are going to conduct now a workshop next week on the 27th of April with the Kampala City Council, um, the Environmental Authority of Barcelona that has participated also in the pilot of Barcelona to exchange views on how to improve waste management in markets. So in that sense, um, we have been successful this time in uh, the cooperation between two different um, local authorities and using um, the data that the children have gathered to show um, a problem that is present in the city. So yeah, that's uh, all from my side. I invite you um, to look at our website um, because uh, it's new <laughs> and we are quite proud of it now because it uh, has taken a long time. So yeah, thanks so much. And if you need uh, anything, you have my email also here. So yeah, thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nora, for that great presentation. Yeah, I'm, I'm super surprised what you have achieved during these three years. Thanks so much, Andrea. So if they, there is not an urgent question, I would like to leave the floor to Claire, which really will bring m more material and more substances for this very wide topic that it's inclusion. So Claire, you can share your screen. Yes. So Claire Murray is um, also a project officer at EXA, 
She's uh, now looking after a project called Seeds, among other things. And now we need to check um, for our Ukrainian colleagues. We have an option may or may not be of preference. So essentially, it turns out, um, thinking about inclusion, I apparently can generate, let's see if this works, um, subtitles in Ukrainian. It's a bit slow, but it works. Would you prefer Ukrainian or would you prefer subtitles in English? That's fun. I would say yeah, the titles in Ukrainian would be <laughs> good. No, no, it's, I mean, it would be good. I think it would be good. Okay, so I will try subtitles in Ukrainian. Uh, obviously, Microsoft is in charge of my subtitles, so I apologize if they are completely terrible. Uh, as Andrea said, my name is Claire. I I'm really enthusiastic and excited about inclusion and I am very focused on trying to give you the power to do something because I think in the world of inclusion it can feel quite overwhelming. So I would like to give you some tools today. There is halfway through my talk a, a time break and I will check then how much time I have taken up and I can stop if necessary or I will keep going as we as we go on. So just to warn you, Link Mayhem will follow. So there will be an awful lot of links coming up in the talk. All of these will be available in my presentation. And where possible, I've tried to identify the Ukrainian options. So you can actually see that in Ukrainian, which is really nice. Um, I personally have three guidelines that I use for equity for engagement, for thinking about how everyone can have a space at the table. And the first one is to engage. And that sounds really obvious, I think, but actually I think it goes exactly back to what Nora was talking about. You must listen and we must hear people's voices because we can make many assumptions, we can use our own biases and actually rule people out of, of participation before they have even started. And I think it's really important to invite discussion, invite perspectives, to really be open to hearing what people have to say. The other thing then is excite. And they, for me, excitement is actually really important because here is where an awful lot of action happens. Exciting people directly is, you know, is directly correlated to people being able to participate. So if somebody, as an example, is coming to a venue that you are running an event at and they cannot access the venue or they are not able to understand the event because there is no sign language interpreter, for example, then they will not be excited. They will not care. They will feel excluded yet again. And so this is where engaging people at the very start and finding out what they need to participate is really important. And then finally, evaluate. This, I think you will have heard lots of talks about this. Evaluation is so important, not just for ourselves and for you know, checking if our project is successful, but also for checking whether people actually were able to participate, whether they enjoyed participation, whether they had fun, because actually I think Nora also mentioned this, you know, if people are not having fun, they will not be motivated to continue in the project. So I always like to think about these three things in the context of any project I am running. Um, Andrea asked me specifically to give some examples of relevant experience that I have. So I am currently a member of uh, one of the UK's biggest research funds in, and they um, support science in scientific facilities, in universities. And I am on their advisory group for equality, diversity and inclusion. I'm also, I was also a panelist on many Athena Swan panels. That is specifically gender equality in research institutions and universities in the UK and Ireland. And the thing that I think is the most relevant to this talk is that actually these experiences have really forced me to reflect on how I design things and how I think about my processes and the projects I create. 
So I have been able to explore inclusion through some of my public engagement projects. So some of the examples are a scientific board game, which I'll talk about in a second, a citizen science chemistry project, and even comedy sets. So talking about the citizen science board game, because that's something that I think is quite, quite important. The thing to think about, um, sorry, it's not actually, I don't know why, it's not citizen science board game, it's a science board game. I should clarify that, I've made a mistake here clearly. So this picture shows three people sitting side by side. On the left is myself, uh, Claire, and then in the middle is my friend Mark Basham, and on the right is my friend Matthew Dunstan. And we are sitting around a board game playing with some of the pieces. Now, this board game is really important as a, an inclusion piece of work because it forced us to think about, first of all, colours and how people who are colourblind actually experience board games, which is actually a big problem in itself, but also to think about how people who are visually impaired. Now, I would call, I would say it's low level visual impairment. So not people who are blind, but people who maybe struggle to make out shapes or will have you know, very poor uh, visibility. How they experience the board game, we were also able to test out, uh, test the game with a deaf school and to learn about their experiences and to work, uh, think about gender. And we decided to make, you know, everything has no gender. So the idea is that when students play the game, they're able to project themselves onto a character that there's no assumption about gender or race or anything else. And um, these experiences then led into us last year design because it was originally designed for schools. It was then redesigned for anyone to play. So it's completely free online and we converted it to a print and play. And there is a graphic on the screen that is flashing through different uh, pictures and close ups of the print and play, including the board game and how you actually cut out the different pieces. There is obviously some things to think about here. So I mentioned previously color. We had to think about the people who would be printing this game. And we thought actually it's a bit unfair to use all of their expensive color ink in our game. So we reduced the color contrast, but we did also say for people who were visually impaired, if you want a highly contrasted version, please contact us directly and we will send you one. What we also did was we sought grants to try and actually support getting the game into underserved communities because we thought this was also important. So those are just some examples of uh, things I have done in, in trying to make my work more inclusive. So to get kind of get going in this, we really need to think about the problem. And, and I think we all know already, there are lots of people who are blocked and excluded, not just from citizen science, from the science space, from the library space, from everywhere. And there's lots of excuses that people have. So to address these problems, you know, it's expensive, it costs money, it's, it's very limited reach, it's got lots of time. These excuses to me are not good enough. They were never good enough, but they're especially not good enough now. And I think, you know, we need to really think about saying the case of citizen science, if we really want to democratize, see this word used an awful lot in citizen science, we talk about democratizing citizen science. Well, then people who are generating citizen science projects have a responsibility to critically evaluate how people do citizen science as much as who does citizen science. And like I said, it's, you know, if we talk about democratizing citizen science, it's not a democracy if only a few people can participate. So these are some of the things that I would like you to be kind of chewing over in the back of your mind. Thinking about, I wanted to look up the Ukrainian perspective and some of the things that I, I, I found were that 6% of the Ukrainian population are reported as being disabled. Um, in the 2020 UN Human Development Report, the Ukraine was 74th out of 189 countries in the Gender Inequality Index. And the Equal Rights Trust, I think it is in 2018, highlighted the poor educational outcomes for Roma children. And this is reflected in the literacy rate and also in high dropouts in their report. So these are things which are, are, are kind of telling us that you know, we really need to try and look at these areas to make sure that these people can participate in any project that we might come up with. But I, 
I really wanted to get your perspective and I, we don't have to do this in breakout groups. I wanted to know what, you know, what you see as being people who are excluded, what sort of barriers are there for participants and for people who might be creating projects, you know, to, to engaging in the citizen science space. So I, if you would prefer, we can, we can go into breakout groups or if you would do it through chat or if you would like to take the mic, I am open to all options. But I would really be curious to know what's your experience on the ground of inclusion? What do you see as being the problem? Maybe I can start? Yeah, please do. Uh, for me, first of all, it's an elderly population. People, when they reach the after 60, after 65, uh, basically for 15, 20 years, they fall out of life. And that leads to lots of problems for families, for communities as well. So that would be the, the first, first problem. Then disabled people, uh, when and they, they, they have difficulties to find jobs. When they find jobs, there are some social projects when they can mend something or see something or something like this, but that doesn't contribute to a, to a meaningful life for them. So after several years, they fall out of the system when they reach maybe the adulthood and then they lost. Uh, also because of the war, we have uh, difficult, well, we have people returning from the war uh, which are disabled or mentally disabled, not disabled, mentally challenged, they have difficulties, mental difficulties and the reintegration process. There are a lot of problems. I, I think there are a lot of them, but still on a massive scale, there is nothing for veterans. Yes, the reintegration program for veterans, also a huge difficulty. And um, yeah, well, that's just up from the top of my head. Yeah, and I think there's lots of you know, it's something that I'm very keen to, to hear about because I don't want to be making assumptions based on some things that I've read on the internet. So I wanted to hear your voices on what you see as being the problem. Does Do any other people have any other groups they think have, are being excluded? Lupko? Yeah, I can say a few words, but you can translate it, ok? I will be translating, so you will add something and I will be translating. With the last research, which was recently published in Ukraine, the most unfortunate group, you can say, is Якщо так комплексно підійти, це жінки похилого віку, які проживають в сільській місцевості. Latest research shows that the most excluded group, that the biggest excluded group are the elderly women in, after 60 elderly women, which live in rural areas. І якщо говорити про наш досвід інклюзії чи залучення таких груп, то ми досить, ми були, можна сказати, з піонерами, ми коли почали працювати з незраціями людьми, в нас був клас, ми перші створили у Львові клас для, комп'ютерний клас для незрячих людей. Also another group from experience, Vasil says, West Ukrainian Resource Center created the first group, a learning group for blind people. And in this class, in this learning group, they helped uh, this audience to learn computer science. They were first who created this learning group uh, in here in, in city of Lviv. Це було, я не знаю, 15 років назад, може більше. Ми активно поширювали спеціальну комп'ютерну програму, яка перетворює букви, які є на екрані, в звуки для незрячих людей. Таким чином ми ніби залучали цю категорію людей до навчання, до якогось там громадського життя, до будь-якої діяльності. 
they had this initiative 15 years ago. They started this initiative 15 years ago. And what they did, they translated uh, visual signals into sound signals uh, to help this audience to participate in any form, any possible form in a social life. Well, I think actually uh, Vasil has picked up something really relevant to what I will be talking about today, because one of the big focuses, given given that we are, you know, we are stuck in a world where we are always online, or many of us are online. Um, and thinking about some of the elderly population, for example, one of the, the challenges is often that, you know, visual impairments or, you know, that they, they really struggle to see many of the images that come online. And so though I have some suggestions for how we can create things that are more inclusive for them, but it's definitely a, a challenge. And I think, you know, programs, I, I would love to see some of the programs that you, you know, suggested earlier being connected to some of these groups, because that would be, be really great to see. I mean, it's something that would be really positive. Um, yeah, thank you, Vassal. I will continue on now, but I think, you know, if there are other groups that you identify, please do drop them into the chat. We'd love to hear about them. Um, as you know, we, we've, I've presented problems and I, like I said at the very start of my talk, I don't believe in just presenting problems. I like to also present solutions and I don't have all the answers to all of the problems, but I'm going to give you some practical tools and tips that are all free. They do not cost you anything to help you explore inclusion in your work. Um, like I said, given the pandemic, I'm mainly focusing on tools for online engagement, just because we're, we're stuck, you know, but in our laptop screens. Uh, but there are many other resources beyond that as well. So this is not, um, this is just a, a small slice of the, the ideas of things you can do. So uh, I will start with the, the talk on, or the section on creating accessible content for people with visual impairments. And then, like I said, we will stop halfway through and we will see where time I'm at. If I have enough time, then I will also talk about um, some of the suggestions for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, so yeah, the, the, one of the biggest and easiest things to start with is something called alt text. And I'm going to explain what that is, why you would use it and how you would use it because those are really important skills. So alt text is a description of the image that we do not see on the page. So when you look at a website, you will not read the words about this, um, this image, but it is in the HTML code for the web page or in the document settings in the case of Microsoft Word. So as one example, in every single image that you see in my slides, I have written in Microsoft PowerPoint a description of the image. So if somebody who was visually impaired wanted to look at my slides, they would be able to see what all the images are and to, or not to see, to understand what the content of the images are. So why would you use alt text? Um, the quote here is directly from somebody called Holly Chook, who is, uh, uses a screen reader herself. And she said that screen readers read image descriptions out loud. This means that blind and visually impaired people can understand the content of the image in an accessible way. If images do not have alt text, then screen readers will simply say image or graphic, which gives no context or meaning. Um, and there is a link here that like, I will share all the links later on. Please do not worry about writing down the links. They are also quite useful um, for search engine optimization. So if you're trying to make sure that people can find your content, having alt text um, for your images really helps. Now, one of the examples that I quite like to use is this one here. This is an image taken from Wikimedia Commons uh, via the White House Flickr account and the photos by Tia Dufour. I would like to see what people would describe this as. So using um, the chat function, can you please describe this in alt text? So it's what would the screen reader read out when it sees this image?
just want to find chat. There we go. Good job, Dimitro. Yep. Yeah. And you see, I think. <laughs> now, look, that's this is where we can get really interesting, right? Because, oh, Nora, Nora. <laughs> so this is where things can get really interesting because people can really use this to tell a very particular story. The, um, the official uh, alt text attached to this image. Nice, Andrea, I like it, like it. Um, I like the fool there, that's a nice little touch. Um, the official uh, description, if you read it here, right, it's quite boring. It says, President Donald J. Trump is introduced on stage uh, Saturday, Marte, Mar March, blah, 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 at the Conservative rally at this place, official White House photo. But if you think about the screen reader, reading all that out, do you, know, do you feel like that actually describes what you see? You know, do we feel like that's a good description? I would say no. no. I would say actually, you know, yes. Dimitro's description is so much better because it's telling you what's happening. You're seeing that, you know, there is, Trump is hugging a flag looking slightly ridiculous. And, and so this is something that can actually be politicized in a way that you know and, and you can have all sorts of crazy things that people can put in but what you need to think about you know is when someone comes to your website or to your document you want to make sure that they can actually engage with your content I've picked quite a silly example I'm sure you can think of you know more serious and appropriate ways of describing things in your own work but it's something that is quite important because you know the, the other description on Wikipedia was President Donald J. Trump embraces the American flag at CPAC 2019. And, you know, it's quite helpful for somebody to have the date there, for example, because that might have an influence on whether that was ridiculous or not. You know, th these are, are all the sorts of things to think about. It, the, the world of alt text is quite big. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do it. But I think just being realistic and being clear and saying this is an image of somebody doing something is a really useful place to start. Um, the hows, these are, are some links just because they describe it way better than I do. And one of the ones just to flag you, you know, is, is this article here by Alex Chen. They did a really good job of talking about it because sometimes when you see an image, you might say, do I need to talk about whether there's a man or a woman or or, or, you know, if the person is black or white, for example. And they discuss that really well and explain it really well. So I'm not going to explain it further. I will just make sure that I share the links later so you can read that. But they also describe how you write alt text. And it's a really nice article. So it's something to recommend. Um, I have also identified the, so in Instagram and also Facebook, they have really nice Ukrainian descriptions of how to write alt text. Unfortunately, Twitter does not have a Ukrainian description, um, but uh, so I, I've included the English link um, and I will share all those links. So if you do use social media, this is where you should be going to try and integrate that into your into your account, because I think the WURC has a Facebook account. So, you know, it would be great to see them, for example, using this if they are not doing it already. I don't have a Facebook account, so I can't check. Um, but that's something to consider. Now, um, this is just a small side note, because I think as a native speaker, especially, I am definitely guilty of this. OK, so when we think about writing, for example, the alt texts or when we think about doing any writing on our websites, language is just as important as the intent or as the meaning of what you're trying to say. And in English, at least, there's a really useful tool called the Hemingway app, which highlights overly complicated language that would make it difficult for people to engage with your content. There is an assumed education level in many projects, but we should check that we are not unnecessarily deterring people before they even register. I am going to show you what this means, right? Because what I've done is I've taken this text, which is intentionally a bit ridiculous. I have used 
this is not a good example of good English, okay? It sounds fancy, but it doesn't need to be fancy. So if we look here, Hemingway app is telling me that my, it, it measures things in American grades. It's saying that my grade level is eight, that I have 67 words, but that I have lots of adverbs. Some of my sentences are very hard to read. And so it helps me actually go, okay, maybe I should try and change my, my words a bit, think about what I'm actually saying. And so what I did is I went back and reworked my language and you can do that on the website, it's really easy. And all that, that like blurb that I just said, I managed to convert into this show is where people might find it hard to stand your content. Check you are not scaring people away before they even start. As scientists, we often are like, as, as you know, as people who use documents, we always go over the word limit. I've already managed to cut away about 20 of my words and go down four grade levels which means that my content is going to be a lot cleaner, a lot easier for people to use, and a lot less, you know, it, it doesn't need to be super fancy. So this is to consider if, you, you know, I appreciate it's in English and I'm sorry that I don't know where to look for the Ukrainian, uh, but at least if you're doing something that you would like to have some English, this is a useful tool to be available. There is more to the world than alt text. So there's things to learn about fonts, colors, shortcuts, but Holly's article really nicely discusses this because one of the classic examples is when you go to some of these really, you know, the Daily Mail in the UK is one of the examples I might have. So this terrible website, if you go there, videos start playing, things start flashing. Somebody who's using a screen reader will, you know, if you don't have a clear way of like, muting the, the video before you even start, they will not be able to find the video. And so the video will keep blaring and they will not know how to find the video on the page. So they will not be able to stop it. So it becomes a really unpleasant experience for somebody who is using a screen reader. And this could very well overlap quite nicely with or overlap with an awful lot of people who are, you know, in the elderly um, age group, because many of them will have issues with trying to navigate websites and things like this as well. Can um, I the other link something yes. a, a screen reader you have to download a screen reader or a screen reader is basically in every computer and reads loud what you see in the screen is it i don't know if they're in every computer um i'm because i think it's something that an awful lot of companies pay to develop to make sure they actually do a really good job of conveying information mm -hmm. and i've never actually used one myself it's just something that i've read uh, a bit about so i think it's something to yeah, to consider. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll see if I can find equivalent uh, screen readers, but there are tools that will tell you that your website is not working very well with screen readers. And that's what some of these, I, I, again, I did warn you, there's lots of links, please don't worry. These links are just for you to look at afterwards. Um, but some of the, the really useful ones is the one that says ssa.gov slash accessibility. This is actually a tool that will highlight where screen readers will have problems. And one of the examples that is brought up quite often is um, search bars, right? People will often just put a search bar in and a search bar is an incredibly amazing tool. It's so useful, it saves so much time. But if you do not code it as a search bar, then the screen reader will have no idea what it is. And somebody who is trying to navigate the website through a screen reader will have no chance of finding the information that they need. So it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very important thing to think about, but it's something that can be easily overlooked. And there's also some more tools around color blindness as well, which is, can be really challenging. Um, my last slide, just before I stop, is to actually mention that if you do use social media, um, hashtags are really important. People use them an awful lot. There's supposed to be a way to help people navigate the topic. But again, screen readers really struggle. And uh, the example I'm going to give you is if you use hashtag Citizen Science United Nations SDGs, that's one word that comes out of the screen readers, you know, relay. Whereas if you capitalize things, then it has, it recognizes that each word is different and then it will make it just a much more pleasant experience for the person using the screen reader. So I will stop here. I can stop. I mean, Andrea, you tell me what you want me to do. I can stop, full stop. We can stop for a break. Um, 
I am flexible, whatever, but that's, if there's any questions, and um, even if we don't have time today, you can drop me an email. And like I said, everything will be shared and made available to you afterwards. So please don't worry. Mm, thank you. No, we are just on time. So <clears throat> we can, we can have a, a round of questions. Is there any doubt or comment? Um, yeah, reflection on what Claire shared with us. Yeah, Luca, please. I have like thousands of questions, but <laughs> That's great. maybe Claire, uh, what, what, can I ask you, what is your background? Um, I am a materials chemist originally. What, and why this topic? Um, I started doing some work on gender equality and was doing lots of public engagement work. And then I started seeing problems there and kind of became involved then in the inclusion group where I used to work. And then I started to kind of ask and, and listen to more experiences. Um, and when you start to get interested in this, if you start following people on Twitter, then some people started to kind of talk about their experiences and talk about things that they found difficult. And it just, it made me go, oh, like I, I've never thought about that. I find that, you know, it's something it would never have occurred to me um, but it's a really easy thing to do. So that's what I've kind of been picking up as I go along. And um, see, so I, I just interest and also wanting to make sure anyone can, you know, that I can make a space where anyone or more people can come to the table than previously. Why well, I'm asking because uh, I've, I've went to work several years for Caritas and I work with street, street children on the streets and they are invisible. Uh, and those groups are invisible mm -hmm. resources. I don't know how you call them. In they, for, first of all, they're invisible. Nobody cares for them. Mm -hmm. But they exist and they influence the society, influence the environment uh, you live in, we live in. And if you don't consider them, if you don't include them, uh, we cannot claim that we can do any meaningful change. And I understand you're from Ireland originally. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're I think, yeah, I mean, I only have like, I only have so much time and so many, like I've tried to bring this as a focus because I think with something like inclusion work, you can go everywhere, you know, you can, there's so many things that you can say, but I think then you can also create a situation where people feel powerless. So I really don't want you that today. And I want to give, you know, share some ideas about things that will give you power to make I change. Have practical question so if you if you see um, somebody who is poor who is disabled who doesn't have resources who doesn't have community nothing um, just trying to survive day by day day by day could be a citizen science a tool to improve their living conditions by engagement by I inclusion have, I mean by inclusion and how okay there's different questions here Lots, ethically yeah. Yeah. Okay, ethically, that's you. You'd have to kind of separate that out because ethically, there's loads of questions around that. That I, I, I am not an ethics expert. Uh, do I want their opinion? Do I want their perspective? Do I want their, you know, their experiences? Yes, but I also don't want to be taking advantage of them, and I don't want to, and because that's the tricky thing, is that people, you know, and I, I'm not experienced at all in this field, so I would. You know, this is where I think I'd be going to maybe people like Nora, people who, you know, people who work in ethics, people who work in in making sure that they're safe and also that you're respecting their, you know, their their livelihood and, and not almost, I don't know, manipulating them or. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you don't pay for the engagement and if it's for pure motivation and then they know the problem the best, uh, they know what's happening in the cities, what's happening in the communities yeah. the best. Uh, where the real Absolutely. problems are but if you engage them without reimbursing them mm. no, and I actually this is important I think it's something that a lot of projects at the moment especially are discussing and it's it's hard because you say we want to support them and and we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way that like you can't just give you know a, a, a child for example is a, 20 is a, euro is a crime I know, but it's, you know, but then you have the ethics questions around that, right? So, and it's something that I think 
there are a lot of projects. I, I would especially look at maybe projects like You Count because they are doing a youth focused citizen science project. Um, yeah. And I, I think they, ha here. they are. Mm -hmm. Raidung and Egle, do you remember on yes. Friday? We yes. have them here. Yeah, because they're doing an awful lot of work with these groups and they're talking about how do you motivate them to stay engaged and, and so forth. And like I said, I think it's a lot, a lot more, they're social scientists, so they're, you know, a bit more experienced. And I think Raiden has got loads of experience in this. So yeah, those are the sorts of people I would talk to. Okay, thanks. No worries. Okay, I, I, I hope that the, the idea is that we have the introduction from Mariana, then the inputs from Nora and also from Claire, and we will have a break now, and then we will come back to the projects part. So hopefully you will have during the break and within the next session, um, a lot of uh, things to, to think about with a, a lot of material, a, good, a lot of new ideas also after these uh, two very powerful presentations. So um, let's meet in 15 minutes more. That's um, at 3.40. Okay, and uh, yeah, enjoy your break. And thank you very much, Claire, again. And thank you, Nora, again. Thanks a lot. Uh, I will not be joining the other session. Uh, because of other commitments. So I wish you a, a good course, everyone, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Nora. Thank you.